and we will start with uh, the research area I'm one of the co-leaders of. My name is Helen Coxall and I'm a paleoceanographer, I would say, from the Department of Geological Sciences and I co-lead RA6 with Margaret Steintor's daughter from the Natural History Museum. So um, the geological record contains um, fantastic examples of earth system processes that have already happened. So it gives, there's lots of opportunities to learn something about um, climate interactions, biotic interactions on very different time scales, ranging from uh, millions of years, multi millions of years, when volcanoes are producing CO2, mountain belts are forming and being destroyed. All these processes produce or consume CO2 in various ways. Um, geological te tectonic plates are moving across the earth, producing mountains and volcanoes in their, in their wake. Um, we've also got insights into lots of other different time scales of climate variability, including orbital changes affecting ice ages and all sorts of other processes. Then we have a fossil record that gives us insight into ecosystems biodiversity change. So there's a huge amount of context for climate change in this record. So for those of you who aren't very familiar with the geological time scale, this is a very nice, accessible little cartoon. Um, I've got, we've got three talks for you um, showcasing some of RA6's research today. The first one, well, actually, no, this is not in the same order as, <laughs> as on the um, sheet, but it's in order of kind of time. So uh, we have a modeling, uh, a modeling perspective looking at um, changes, how, how could changes in plankton <coughs> biomineralization affect CO2 um, in, in the oceans. That, that could kind of, there's a perspective on glacial and interglacial timescales, but this is something that could be applied to much longer time periods. Then we've got, we'll move to the Miocene period. So around 10 million years ago, that, that will be our first speaker who will, look, who, who will show us how we can learn something about um, the interactions between mountain building and climate, so atmospheric circulation. And our final talk, we'll, we'll go back a little further in time to the mid-Cretaceous, so around 100 million years ago, to a super hot, super greenhouse period where um, Chris will tell us something about uh, the evolution of fire resistance in, in plants. So in RA6, we, we're very multidisciplinary, and we're looking at all kind of aspects of the Earth climate system. Uh, so far, we, we collaborate with, with modelers, um, with, with RA5, who, who look at the kind of slightly younger paleoclimate region. Um, and we, we're definitely looking for more opportunities to integrate with the biologists, ecologists, where we have this all this overlap, ice, water. We, we've kind of got everything in some way in the fossil record. Um, this year we've had we've, we've funded seed projects, we've uh, funded lots of conference attendances, and we had a very successful workshop in in January last year where we we got together a load of world experts on the Eocene and Ligocene climate transition 34 million years ago when Antarctica first glaciated and now we've got one of our, our postdocs funded by the um, Berlin Centre who's leading a, a very great review on this so that's been a really great output of this year. So without further ado I will move on to our first speaker and I can introduce Ruben Hansen and he will tell us about mountains and hopefully some climate links. Thank you. All right, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming to this talk. Uh, my name is Ruben. I am a PhD student at IGB. I specialize in tectonics, uh, mountain building, uh, and in particular, the mountains in Oman, which are located in the northeast uh, corner of the Arabian continental plate. So as part of my research, one interesting question was how does the mountain, how do the mountains in Oman affect the uh, Somali jet? So here's just a photo of the central mountains 
It's a 700 kilometer line mountain range. We have elevation. Uh, there's about a 3,009 3, meter peak just off the side here. So this is a high, a big mountain range basically. So I'll just discuss the Somali low-level jet. Um, this <coughs> originates basically in the southern hemisphere, east of Madagascar. We have this high-pressure system. Uh, it's moving counterclockwise here, and then it moves west, hits the uh, East Africa coastline, gets channeled, deflected by the, the mountains, and flows northwards up past Arabia. So the Amman Mountains are this range in here, and we go into India. So it starts in May, and it sort of progresses up, hits India by June, July, August, and we get a lot of precipitation up here. And this jet is a very narrow zone. This is these colours represent wind speeds. Um, basically, this is 10 metres per second or greater, the greens and the reds. Um, it's travelling about one, one and a half kilometres above sea level, so it's quite a low line jet stream. So this is the same map, but I'm trying to show the topography. So these hatched areas, is areas that are higher than one kilometre topography. So they have the possibility of influencing the Somali jet. Um, and then the colours represent the precipitation rates. This is for July. So we're getting a lot of basically moisture getting picked up from the Indian Ocean and the Arabian Sea and dumped into East India and Southeast Asia. Uh, also, another, it's a quite a complicated system, so topography is only one factor influencing it. Um, another thing is we have a low pressure system in India that's helping to suck the, the jet stream into India. So the jet stream, um, the Somali jet apparently started around 10 million years ago. Uh, and this is the same time where we had high topography forming in all these regions through this area. Uh, the Himalayas started colliding 50 million years ago. But the peak elevation start influencing the, the jet stream. Uh, as well as that, we have an intensification of AMA. So let's just summarise that. So now we go back to the Al Hajar Mountains in Oman. So these mountains, the timing is a little bit debated. Um, there's sort of two possible time zones that have been proposed. We have either a late Cretaceous around 70 million years ago. This is when a major tectonic event happened. Uh, you had the Samal Ophiolite, this is oceanic crust, was thrust on top of the continental boundary of Arabia. Um, and so possibly the mountains formed then at 70 million years. But there is the a presence of some shallow marine sedimentary rocks, so the Oligocene, Miocene age, on the flanks of the mountains um, that have been folded and tilted. So definitely some deformation has happened after the Miocene. Um, so some people say all deformation was post-Miocene, or some say there's a mixture of both. So we don't really know. So I started my PhD to really nail down the timing of the mountain uplift. So the first question is, are they currently active? Um, this is a seismic, basically, map of the last 100 years. Uh, all these coloured symbols reflect earthquake, earthquake points, and it really defines the Arabian plate. Uh, this is basically the boundary here, and it comes here. So Arabia is moving north into Eurasia about two to three centimetres a year. We have continental collision, really active zone here, subduction here. But the mountain range in Oman, this chain through here, that's very low seismicity. So, and there's absence of basically faulted quaternary gravels. So we conclude that whatever formed the mountains, it's not an active process today. So they're not active. So there's some, they're older than current day. So what we do is use low temperature thermochronology to try and understand the uplift of the mountain, the timing of the uplift. So this works basically, we have 
sequence of rocks and you sample at X amount of depth um, with the geothermal gradients typically around 25 degrees per kilometer. So with depth you're increasing in temperature. Then you have some kind of collision event, horizontal shortening, and you create this uplift which steepens the terrain and increases erosion rates. And the erosion basically means that your sample is exhumed towards the surface and it's cooling. So we can measure the age of this cooling with three thermochronometers. We have appetite helium, appetite fish and shake, and zircon helium. So this is like a simple steady state model where you have continued horizontal shortening, uplift, erosion. So your rock is continuously moving up towards the surface. So our three thermochronometers, these are the closure temperatures for each different one. And the timing or the clock starts ticking as it passes through the different closure temperatures. So, for example, the zircon helium is the hottest at about 180 degrees. And that would start taking time and it starts ticking away. And then the appetite fish and check does the same. And then I'll just speed that up. So then I come to the surface, I take my sample, and I can get three different ages that reflect three different temperatures. And this will tell us the time at which uplift occurred and also the rates, how fast the uplift was. So here's just one model of one sample we used um, from the central mountains. We have this temperature time plot. Uh, these, each path is just a random path that tries to fit the data. And the purple is basically a 90% confidence. Uh, the history before 50MA wasn't really constrained, but our data shows that we had this major cooling event at 40 to 30MA, and then it sort of slows down. By 20 erosion that's been generated by uplift. Additionally, we use this, another method, uranium dating of calcite silicon fibers. So when uh, you have the horizontal shortening and deformation of the upper crust, you get the faultines. So we have thrusts um, like this one. This is a strike slip fault. And during rupture, you, you create a void between on the, on the fault plane. And because the host rock is all carbonate, basically limestones, you get calcite fibers crystallizing along the fault plane. And they basically form at the same time as fault rupture. So we can date these fibers, and this has given us an age of brittle deformation. So we went to Amman, we targeted all the, the reverse faults, thrust faults, strike slip faults that had the horizontal shortening that formed the uplift in the mountains. And we got a range of ages from 40 million years to 16. So this matches pretty well for our cooling ages which was 40 to 20. So we conclude that the mountain started deforming, uplifting at 40 MA, and then basically stopped at 16, and probably reached the peak elevation at 16 MA. And now not, not a lot's been happening since. So how does that tie into the Somali jet? Because this kicked off at 10 million years, which means our mountains are about 6 million years older. So unfortunately, we can't say that the Amman Mountains are like the driving force for this whole system. But the interesting thing is, I'd say for, as far as topography, the, the Somalia is deflected by the East African Highlands first um, at 10 million years, and the mountains were already there. So they definitely helped channel the flow. If they were younger than the Somali, than the 10 million years, then perhaps Somali jet wouldn't enter so far into East Asia and maybe further into Iran and Pakistan. But we don't know. This is just pure speculation. So this is the last slide. I just sort of show you possible, the effect the mountains have. This was taken in May 2012. So it's sort of the initiation of the, the jet stream. Uh, you can see the white. So this is the mountain, mountain range here. You can see these white clouds define the cold front. So we have this system moving in from the from the north and also the system in from the south. 
And then you can see how the, the, the topography in Oman is, is influencing this weather pattern. So I guess what's needed next is we have pretty much constrained all the timing of uplift along this whole system from East Africa right up to Oman, Zagros, the Makran in, in Pakistan and also the Himalayas and the Tibetan Plateau. So the next step would be to probably create some atmospheric surface, uh, atmospheric uh, models that can take into account the uplift as well. And that pretty much sums up my talk. Thank you. Thanks very much, Rupin. I can see already there are some questions. I think uh, Karen was the first one to. <laughs> you have one left. Okay. Um, how are you constraining the age of the intensification of the Somali jet? That's um, that's not my expertise, but what I've read is we have a lot of dust derived sediments being deposited um, and so this the idea of that is it's because of the jet stream bringing over from Arabia etc. Yeah exactly. Yeah. Uh, thank you Ruben, that's a, a fascinating talk. Uh, you're, when you're dating uplift, you're looking at the, a rock moving up. Right. And if I look at that steady state model, how do I actually know that it's not erosion of the top that's driving the uplift so there is no relief change and it's pushing from below? How do I know from, how do I know that it's move, that rock is moving up quickly, so how do I know the mountains are growing? Because, um, yeah, it's an interpretation that it's uplift. The fact is there's high topography there. So that is definitely there, and you should have a cooling signal at some point in history. Um, so I think it's a fair call to say the cooling is related to that. Um, and there's a lot of erosion. Yeah. <laughs> so in the, in, the Him, in the Himalayas, there's been some uh, success with using oxygen isotopes and lake sediments for paleo altimetry. I was wondering, do you have any lakes up up in there? Any uh, any paleo lakes that uh, might give you carbonates? I don't know. Um, there's some man-made lakes, but um, yeah, that wouldn't do it. Yeah. 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 All right. Any more questions? Then we thank uh, Rupin again for his talk and move on to our next speaker, Chris Mays, who is my colleague at the Department of uh, Paleobiology at the Swedish Museum of Natural History. And Chris will be talking to us about fire adaptation of plants in hothouse climates. Thanks, Mark. Okay, thanks for uh, tuning in, folks. Um, so today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about a, a spot on the Earth that not many people know of. Uh, it's a place called the Chatham Islands. And this is, uh, the Chathams have provided a, a nice little window into a, a time period which is uh, one of the hottest on Earth's record. Um, now, the first question I, I get from people when I mention I work on the Chatham Islands is, where in the world are they? Uh, now, I know Ruben knows, um, uh, only because they have 15, well, five minute discussion, but um, if you, if you basically go uh, north or south or east or west from this area in the, in the world and you arrive on the exact opposite side of the earth, uh, you'll pretty much arrive at the Chatham Islands. It's about, as, it's about as far from here as you can get while still being on the planet. Uh, so the Chathams are, are a part of the Zealandian landmass. You might have heard of this uh, 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 as a geologically significant part of the Earth's, uh, earth's continental crust. Um, it's mostly underwater. Includes New Zealand and the Chathams and a couple of other, other islands further north. Uh, the, the rocks that I've been looking at are uh, the, in the Cretaceous period, so uh, roughly about 95 to 100 million years old, and they're all on uh, this little island called Pitt Island. There's about 40 people there, um, uh, and uh, lots of fish, lots of sheep, lots of, uh, um, lots of fishing going on. And it's, if you haven't heard of it, it's probably because it very rarely looks like this. It usually looks a bit more like this. Um, so it's a little less of a tourist zone than, than say, some of the other parts of Zealandia, uh, like New Caledonia. Uh, now, my fieldwork uh, 
uh, gave us a bit of an anecdote which is quite useful to tie into this uh, fire adaptation story. Uh, one of my earlier field, field uh, expeditions in 2009 uh, coincided with this little event. Uh, we were doing some field work in, the, uh, in, in this part of the world. Uh, there's no access to the internet or phones for our field work for uh, five to six to seven weeks at a time. Um, and then we see the sun go a little bit of an orangey red uh, during our field season. Um, so we started thinking of apocalyptic scenarios which might have caused this uh, to happen. It looked like a bit of smoke had gone across the sun here. Uh, we started thinking, okay, well, which way is the prevailing wind? Is it coming from Chatham Island, the main island? And uh, it doesn't seem quite right. It's coming from the west. Okay, oh, maybe New Zealand's on fire. Maybe there's some, some nasty things going off 800 kilometers to the west. Uh, as it turns out, this is what the, the scene looked like in southeastern Australia at the time, which is 3,000 kilometers to the west. Uh, there was a huge amount of fires going on, and this is the most devastating fire uh, or bushfire season uh, known on, in human history. Uh, killed nearly 200 people, uh, and it was very devastating for that region, as you can imagine. That smoke plume actually went right around the Earth twice in the southern hemisphere, uh, and it could be detected uh, by satellites. So this is just a satellite image of the, the worst day of that uh, bushfire season. Now, uh, Australia has a bit of a reputation for uh, things that can kill you. Uh, <laughs> spiders, snakes, uh, scorpions, sharks, stingrays. Um, and not many people think of the trees as deadly. And unfortunately, I wish I liked to, uh, to dispel any, any stereotypes, but even the tre trees will kill you, as you can find out. And apart from some of the cute, fuzzy little marsupials, uh, that holds up. Uh, so this is what it looked like after the fires. Uh, you can see the, the trees have become more or less blackened sticks. Uh, now it's worth noting a couple of things here. This is prime real estate for new plants to develop. Uh, you've, you've burnt away all of the, uh, the understory, uh, you've left uh, quite easy access to the, the mineral soil, uh, you've got very little uh, canopy left, all the, all the leaves have been burnt off, and so if, you can, if you're a young plant, this is prime time to, to establish yourself uh, and to flourish in, in the wake of, uh, uh, of the devastation. And just a year later, this is what the trees look like. Uh, these plants actually have a nice adaptation to sprout back after the fires, and look like these sort of green pipe cleaners. Uh, so this is a photo I took uh, in the area uh, about a year later. So uh, this, these plants in particular, eucalyptus, is, a, is renowned for being uh, a, a, a very flammable sort of plant. It, it exudes a, a thing called eucalyptus oil, which is very highly flammable, and it promotes fires. It's actually a pyro... Uh, what's the word? Pyromantic? No, pyro... Pyromaniac plant, <laughs> uh, and uh, what what it's actually doing is is promoting fires, and it clears out all of the herbivores from the area, which allows for the seeds to uh, to be dispersed onto this nice uh, fresh landscape. So we're going to tie it into the Chatham story because we see a very similar and very interesting corollary uh, in these rocks. So one of the things that are worth mentioning at this point is uh, uh, after I've just explained where the Chathams were, uh, where the Chathams are, I like to explain explain where they were during the formation of these rocks and when these fossils were living. So if we jump in our, in our time machine of choice, we go back to the South Polar region. You can see that the world looks quite different. This is uh, whilst the, the larger uh, uh, supercontinent of Gondwana was still largely attached. You have Australia, Zealandia, and Antarctica. And the key point of this image here is to note that this is, a key, this is a, an accelerated time of rifting. So a lot of outgassing of, of uh, greenhouse gases, particularly carbon dioxide and methane. Uh, sea levels were very high. This, the temperatures were very high. Uh, these are all related, as you, as you guys know, I'm sure. Uh, another interesting factor is that the thermal gradients, the, the difference of temperature between the equator, or equatorial region and the polar regions was much lower than today. So the temperature difference is around 15 to 23 degrees. Uh, compare that to the equatorial to south polar region is somewhere between 45 or 50 degrees today. Uh, and because of this uh, in combination of high temperature, high CO2, uh, and a lack of, of polar ice, you have more or less pole to pole forests. You have a lot of vegetation in these uh, on the continental regions. In fact, these plants, as, well, as if we go back here, these Chatham Islands were actually tucked right in within the south, south polar circle. 
and yet despite that we have really quite flourishing forests. So <clears throat> this is a, a pretty bland looking rock. Um, in, in my I'm a teaching job, I would usually describe this rock less as a sandstone and more of a blandstone. Uh, there's not much going on. There's a couple of hidden little treasures though on the surface that might be worth looking into. So this thing here is a piece of fossil plant with a little bit of amber sticking out. So when you see something like that, and the fact that this fossil is so badly preserved, it's sort of desiccated and drying out, uh, it's better to leave it in the rock and just blast it with uh, x-rays or some sort of uh, radiation to go through the rock. So that's what we did here. So we stuck this rock in a, uh, in a nuclear reactor, actually. Uh, we bombarded it with neutrons, and we saw what came out the other side. This is uh, uh, the only active nuclear reactor in Australia. Uh, and when you turn the lights out, all the, the neutrons emitting from the, radi from the radioactive uh, uranium uh, emit this nice little blue light. Uh, so this is what it looked like on the inside. You, that's that, that fossil that you saw just poking out on the surface. And this all this grey here is the, is the rock surrounding it. So at first sight, it's like, okay, what the heck is that? Well, if you put it into the context of what uh, it might look today, this is a part of a pine cone, or this is part of a, a seed cone. Uh, in fact, it's a cypress cone. Now, this is uh, what I call a virtual extraction of that rock. So what we've done is we've blasted it with neutrons. This is a 3D model of it. And you can just strip away the, the rock itself, and you're left over with just the fossil bit. Uh, all these little green parts are a false color image of the fossils. And there's actually eight of those, those little T-shaped fossils hiding in here somewhere, uh, which is a pretty, pretty neat little thing to find. And it's a new species that we found. Uh, this is what a single uh, specimen looks like. If you do a 3D model of that one specimen, it's got this nice sort of winged structure to it. There's a few uh, morphological characters worth noting there, but don't worry too much about that. The main thing to note is what's, what's on, in, on the inside. So this yellow, yellowy orange stuff is that amber that we saw just poking out on the rock itself. The amber is, is, is entirely filling this, this uh, type of fossil. It's, uh, it's up to 40% of the total volume of these fossils. And a couple of interesting anatomical points about these fossils is the uh, resin, or the, 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 the resin which is later turns into amber, Resin serves a couple of very important functions uh, for these plants. One is uh, as, a, as an adhesive, and another one as a flammable substance, just like our eucalyptus oil. Uh, it can be quite useful for promoting fires and very useful if you uh, need to uh, reproduce using a, a fire. So in this case, what the, the, what the resin is serving in this, uh, these fossils is to uh, hold the, the seed cones closed with that resin function and also to, to promote fires to allow seed release. So how do we know all that? How, do we, how can we actually point to some evidence to say that that's, that's what the function it was doing? Well, there's some good analogues uh, in the modern world which do very similar things. So you imagine that those little T-shaped structures is an individual seed cone scale like these uh, modern jack pines. Uh, those are actually held together uh, in North, these are the North American pine species held together with resin. They're, they're, they're basically glued shut. And when the fire comes through, that resin melts and the seeds pop open to allow the seeds to be released in that sort of devastated environment. Uh, and the anatomy itself can be quite useful. So this is a little model showing uh, what the seed cone would look like with all the, those little structures put back together onto a single cone. Now, a few things. Uh, the, red, the red parts of these fossils here indicate where the resin reaches the surface of the fossil. So you've got them uh, lining up, uh, uh, sort of adhering to each other on the upper surface of each fossil. If you look at it in a slice section like this, there's a whole bunch of resin oozing out on the outer surface of these uh, fossils as well, which would have promoted the, uh, uh, any sort of environmental fire to catch, uh, to catch on to those ends there. Um, and you can see that in the, uh, the, the neutron images, that that's, uh, it's, it's, it's been exuded out of that outer surface. After it had been heated up, the, the, uh, the resin, which is bonding the whole thing closed, ends up melting, and you release those seeds. And this is a little reconstruction of what the whole cone would have looked like from our artist at the Natural History Museum, and uh, just shows how the thing would have released its seeds after the fire. Last but not least is the, an independent evidence, or line of evidence, to show that this is uh, a fire adaptation rather than some sort of other seed dispersal, uh, dispersal mechanism. 
is we have a whole bunch of charcoal associated with these uh, these fossils. Uh, not only are, is it, you do find charcoal sitting next to it and on the same horizons, but also some of them have actually been charcoalified. They've been cooked uh, prior to uh, prior to burial. Uh, now this is where the fossils have been found. These little yellow diamonds, uh, and every single sample that we have uh, where these have been found, we have a lot of charcoal, a much higher than uh, proportion of charcoal in those samples than you would expect from random chance. Uh, so there's no other really good reason why that might be unless these guys were preferentially living in fire prone environments. So this is what I call the smoking gun or smoking tree evidence of uh, necrotaceous uh, hothouse conditions and fire adaptation. So how does this fit into the uh, global context? Why do, we, why do we care about this one little spot which is interesting, you know, but uh, how does it fit into what was going on globally? So uh, similar fossils have been found uh, in the Northern Hemisphere for over 100 years, but people just didn't know what the heck they were. And uh, well, they knew it was a plant of some sort, but they didn't understand the function of these things until we saw these things uh, in the Chatham Island. So they're all clustering, clustering within a pretty short time frame as well, within uh, somewhere between 89 to 113 million uh, years. Uh, and they're consistently found with these charcoal and resin-rich uh, deposits. So you find them in Greenland, you find them in, uh, in North America and mainland Europe. Uh, so this is the first time we've managed to interpret these things for what we think that they are and as a fire-adapted uh, fire uh, sea dispersal mechanism. Uh, also, uh, using a bit of uh, phylogenetic data, it looks like the, the pines first evolved their fire adaptations in the same period. <clears throat> so this is indicating a synchronous high-latitude uh, evolution of two distinct plant groups uh, convergently arriving at this uh, at this adaptation. So what the heck was going on at this time to promote it? Now when uh, Helen first asked if I wanted to give a talk uh, for the Berlin Centre, um, she made sure that I emphasised the climate angles and so I put in some graphs. I think that, uh, so because you know climate science is graphs, right? Uh, so here we have what the the, uh, the charcoal record over the last 250 well, sorry 350 last uh, 350 million years looks like the highest charcoal abundance of the last 250 million years occurred during this interval. The highest oxygen, highest temperature, and the highest burn probability all occurred within this this time frame. And those, as as you may be aware, those uh, factors are all uh, related. Uh, for example, temperature. Uh, I'll, I'll explain how they might be in a second. So why at that time? What was happening at that time that would have caused this fire adaptation uh, to evolve independently in two groups and in two different different parts of the world? <clears throat> so if we go back to our global picture just for a second, uh, we remember that uh, this is an interval of accelerated uh, continental breakup, a lot of outgassing, a lot of carbon dioxide and other methane, uh, sorry, other greenhouse gases being released because of that breakup. This would have raised global temperatures increase the, the total forested area and, and productivity of the globe, uh, which would have increased the photosynthesis rates, atmospheric oxygen goes up, uh, and things in a high, a high oxygen atmosphere become much more flammable. They become much more likely to ignite uh, at low temperatures. Um, and this leads to a, a fire prone world, and this is the highest oxygen, uh, atmospheric oxygen in the last 250 million years uh, for any extended period of time. Uh, so that's essentially the, the general gist. Now, this this sort of line of logic is is, is slowly being built up over you know numerous uh, research groups around the world. Uh, I'm, I'm just been put, putting uh, the sort of final uh, uh, fossil indicators to help support this, and uh, I'm happy to take any questions you guys might have about that. Just first, I'd like to thank all these lovely people for helping out, um, and uh, yes, if you have any questions, I'd like to address them. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Chris, for this great talk. We have time for uh, one or two quick questions. Ray, here you go. Yeah, I think there's some big missing pieces to the climate story because although it gets hotter, uh, uh, it also gets wetter in a lot of places. In some places, it may get drier. But in that particular place where the Chatham Islands are, uh, especially being so close to the coast, it would be hard for that region not to get a whole lot wetter. As far as the oxygen story goes, the temperature 
increases photosynthesis, it also increases respiration. So, it, so it's the net of the photosynthesis over carbon burial that goes into the oxygen story. And so, so again, there's not such a, you know, there may be other reasons the oxygen is high, but it's not a clear connection like in that set of arrows there. But, but it's the thing that's testable in climate models is definitely the, the precipitation, which can be fed into a, a fed into a, a fire model. And I was wondering if there's a plan to actually do that. I decided to present it to uh, people here. Um, they're filling some of those gaps. Now, we didn't actually publish that, uh, that whole list of logic. We only got up to the, uh, the fossil record and the, the, the biogeography side. But yeah, that's a really good point. Um, that's something to definitely think about with remodeling, is how could, that, how could the precipitation actually influence that? And that would definitely dampen the fire uh, in that region. And it, I think the, the only thing that's worth mentioning from that is, um, that I can answer, is that um, it is curious that the, the distribution of these fossils is only at the high latitudes. Um, I suspect that there may be some sort of climatic control on that. Uh, and that our, I suspect, you know, putting a hypothesis out there, is that those regions will probably end up being modeled as fairly dry for some reason, uh, relative to the, to the mid and low latitudes. But um, yeah, that's a, that's a great hypothesis. To, to investigate. If you can help me out, that'd be great. Okay, we can take one more question. <laughs> Sorry. How about the orbital parameters during this time period? I mean, uh, how much sunlight was there in this yeah, region so at that time? The insulation rates and all, yeah, the, uh, there's been some pretty long, long term models, and it seems like the, the, um, the light regime is very similar to today, uh, at least until the mid-Jurassic. So it's, um, this interval is more or less going, undergoing similar Milankovitch-style uh, uh, oscillations. Um, and so, and it would have had very similar axial tilt. Uh, so it's, it's very little evidence to show that it would be any different than today. So that's, that's a curious aspect because how the heck do these plants flourish so well at such high latitudes when you're only really getting South, you're only getting a maximum of eight or nine months of light at all. So, yeah, it's an interesting question, yeah. Okay. Thanks again, Chris, for a great talk. Thanks. And uh, we'll move on to our last speaker, Marlene Oertalen. And as both Chris and uh, Ray Pierhombert mentioned, climate modeling is also important. Yes. So, she will <laughs> so she will talk uh, to us about aspects of, um, where are we? Uh, or organic material in CO2 storage in the oceans. Yeah. Go ahead. Thanks. Yeah. 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 yeah, there it goes. Okay, so uh, thanks, Chris, for a great talk. It will be hard to follow that one, but I'll do my best. So um, I'm working with uh, period climate modeling, and I'm trying to look at why variable elemental composition of the organic material might be important for the ocean CO2 storage. That's a complicated title, uh, so I decided to simplify it a little bit. Uh, so effects of adaptive ocean biology on CO2, both in the atmosphere and how it stores in the ocean. Um, working together with uh, my supervisors, Jonas and Johan, here uh, at the Department of Metrology, and then also with Kevin Oliver in Southampton and uh, Andrew Twell, who's in the US. And uh, so why are we doing this at all? Uh, well, during the last glacial cycles, um, here is one of the wiggly lines that uh, Helen always says we're so fond of in paleoclimate. But uh, so the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere has been changing a lot during the past 800,000 years because of the ice age uh, cycles, and we well we see that it varies during the past four ones between about 280 during interglacials and 180 during glacials. And uh, so this is a very consistent um, cyclical system, but uh, climate models don't really succeed to reproduce this drawdown of, of CO2. Uh, so we don't get down to 180, and we don't really know why that is. I think Karen has a good idea on that. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, we... Uh, thought that, well, since most studies agree that uh, this, most of the CO2 went into the ocean and that it probably had to do with changes in ocean circulation or changes in, in 
the conditions for the biology and how it works, we should look into what the models are doing with the ocean biology. And uh, the main question is why uh, are our climate models unable to simulate the full extent of fluctuations in CO2 that occur during glacial cycles? And can we improve the way we model bi ocean biology and thereby improve this capability of the models? And uh, a sort of side question is, does this influence the ability of models to accur accurately simulate other climate states, such as historical warm periods or future scenarios or etc. Uh, Philippa, who's up there, she will be talking about the same sort of uh, adaptive uh, biology in, in modern climate tomorrow morning. So if you find this interesting, she'll, she can talk more about it tomorrow as well. Uh, so I will not answer all these questions today, but it's something we definitely need to think about, and I will get back to it also towards the end. So when ocean biology uh, produces organic matter, it does whatever plants do on land. It takes nutrients, sunlight, CO2, and water, and produces organic matter and oxygen. And when these organisms die in the surface ocean, they fall down, they're remineralized in the deep ocean, and then the nutrients and the carbon comes back up. And this is called the soft tissue pump. And the soft tissue pump is bringing a lot of carbon to the deep ocean. And uh, most ocean models represent this by using the red field ratios, which, well, red field presented these since like 1953, saying that on average, the organic material in the ocean is composed uh, out of for every nutrient uh, molecule or every phosphate molecule, um, every phosphorus atom, we have 16 nitrogen, uh, 106 carbon, and 138 oxygen are released. And this works on average, but if the elemental composition varies, locally, then a certain number of nutrient atoms will not always bring the same amount of carbon with it to the deep ocean, and therefore it can affect the ocean carbon storage capacity. And as I said, the climate models tend to have this very simple, very constant representation of this. So is this simplicity of the biology in the models one of the factors that is preventing us from reproducing the, the drawdown of CO2 during the glacials? So uh, I found this um, study by Galbraith and Martini from 2015 where they studied ocean biology. Uh, so they took samples of the organisms living in the surface ocean and they checked what ratio their organic matter had of, in this case, phosphorus to carbon and how it was related to the surrounding conditions, so the surrounding nutrients in the water. And just as a reference, here is the 106, 1 to 106 average that uh, Redfield presented. So we see that if it varies this much locally, and if we change in a different climate, if we change the surface nutrient field, then we will change the ratios that are distributed in different places in the ocean. And the reason that this is so variable is because both the species composition and also the species themselves, one species can adapt to how much nutrients are available. So if we have a, a lot of nutrients, then we will have organisms that need a lot of nutrients to produce their, their cells. Whereas if we have fewer nutrients, either they just become a bit more uh, frugal and save their nutrients or we even get species that are better at living at those conditions. And uh, as we can see, here is the ocean <coughs> phosphate concentration uh, from uh, the World Ocean Atlas. So this is from, from observations, or refitted from observations. We can see that it varies a lot in the surface ocean, especially we have a lot of nutrients in the southern ocean and then also up in the North Pacific and around the uh, Pacific Equator region. We have a lot of nutrients left in the surface oceans that, that are not being used. And we think that during glacial cycles, these nutrients were used more efficiently. So we will lower the concentrations 
perhaps in these regions. And uh, we wanted to test this in a climate model. So we use the CG uh, model, which is a quite low resolution climate model, but it's very efficient, so we can do a lot of runs. And uh, as you can see, even though it's quite uh, low resolution, it reproduces the modern ocean phosphate concentration quite well. And this is sort of our pre-industrial modern um, um, reference state. And the original version of it uses the red field ratios, as most other, other models do, but we developed a new version where we put in these variable ratios instead. And throughout um, our study, we will be comparing these two versions of the model. So we put this in, and uh, this means instead of having 106 carbon taken up, taken up per, per phosphate atom that is taken up by biology in every single grid cell, which means basically a bluish color all over the map. We get this huge variation from 1 to 60 up to 1 to 160. So it varies quite a bit um, already. And then if we change the climate, how does this field change and how does that affect the ability of the of the biology to take up carbon compared to if we just stay at 106 everywhere. So we do a bunch of sensitivity experiments where we do we make changes in the model that will be sort of representative of a glacial state and we vary these things individually and also we put them together to form sort of a more glacial like state. It, we still haven't um, done the sort of more the full glacial um, simulation because this is very much ongoing work. But this is a combination which is sort of moving towards a glacial, at least, um, more similar to a glacial than the pre-industrial state in the model. So uh, we affect the ocean circulation by changing the winds in the Southern Ocean. We increase the remineralization length scale, which increases the amount of carbon that is, is stored in the ocean. We add a bit more of dust deposition, which we know happened during glacials from, from paleoproxies. So we have, uh, we put more iron in the ocean, which increases the, the potential for the biology in the Southern Ocean to, to use the nutrients, because now there's a lack of iron there. But if we add more, they can, they can actually be more productive. And then glacial albedo, which just gives us colder conditions. And as I said, we vary these individually, but we also make a combined simulation where we uh, do we reduce the winds uh, in the Southern Ocean by half, and then a bit of increase in remineralization length scale, and then this dust and albedo. And as I said, also we do all the experiments twice: once with the red field version of the model, and then once with this variable stoichiometry, as it's called, or variable elemental composition. And uh, First, to the left, we have the same two maps again. We have the surface phosphate distribution in the pre-industrial and the corresponding C to B ratios. And on the right-hand side, we have the winds and the, uh, the wind changes that are causing a surface phosphate anomaly. And we can see that something is definitely happening uh, in the Southern Ocean. And we also see some changes uh, in the Pacific. And we can see that the corresponding changes in the C to P ratios well, we're definitely increasing them here, so we're taking up more carbon per phosphate in the southern ocean. And there are some changes in the Pacific, but that region is not very productive. So uh, in this case, it's quite likely that we will have a, an increase in carbon storage capacity compared to the Redfield version. And we will see the results from this in a, in a minute, how it affects the CO2 both, well, how it affects the CO2 storage capacity of the ocean and thus the atmospheric CO2. And this is the combined simulation, um, the same thing. We see that the surface uh, phosphate anomaly is even larger, especially in the sort of northern half of the Southern Ocean. And the C to P ratios are changing quite a bit in all of these productive regions, so, or in these regions where we had a lot of. Uh, the non-productive regions, where we had a lot of phosphate left over in there. So all of these regions, the biology becomes 
probably more efficient. So if we look at the results then, on the left uh, hand axis we have the anomaly in PCO2. So we start the simulations at 278 ppm in the pre-industrial reference, then we make these glacial changes and go to a new equilibrium state. And in the individual simulations we see that for the Southern Ocean wind we get a decrease in the red field version, which is the yellow dot, uh, by about 12 or so ppm. And with the variable elemental composition version we get slightly bigger reduction in atmospheric CO2. And that's sort of the case for all the individual variations, maybe not so much for the albedo changes. But when we combine them, we actually get a 25% larger drawdown in this model with the variable elemental composition. So from this, I'd say we draw the conclusion that climate models tend to have a too simple, maybe, representation of biological CO2 uptake. And the species adaptability to the surrounding conditions can be represented by this uh, equation. Uh, this is the equation for phosphate, I should say. There is a similar one for nitrate. And then in glacial scenarios, maybe this can actually improve our ability to simulate the CO2 drawdown that happened. And the species composition of ocean primary producers changed a lot during, for example, the very warm, warm high CO2 period of the PETM, uh, and also during the transition between warm and cold of the Eocene Oligocene. And maybe if we want to uh, simulate these periods, uh, it would also be important to include this, to capture this um, change in species composition that happened. So yeah, that was it. Thank you. Malin. Excellent. Really interesting results. Good talk. Any questions, Malin? Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much for this very interesting talk. First of all, I'd like to say that this is really in the vein of Bertolin's interests. Oh, this was that's really nice. what he was doing, trying mm -hmm. to understand the deep ocean circulation and the carbon budget. Mm -hmm. I do have a question, though. Um, mm -hmm. How about the time scales? How long did you run the ocean model to obtain these equilibrium states? Uh, and is 10, it compatible? Years. Is that a bit long compared to the glacial cycles? or what, Yeah, what, I, I'm not running transient states, but I want to look at the, the sort of equilibrium state because we know that the forcing was fairly similar for at least a few thousand years. And if you look at the simulation after about, say, 3,000 years, it's also uh, more or less similar to this. It doesn't change that much. Yeah. I just wanted to clarify. So the C to P ratio is dynamic, right? Yeah. It's not prescribed? Yeah. OK. And it's dynamic following this equation? Following okay. that, yeah. Um, going to these um, red field ratios again, mm. or a non-red field red field ratio, <coughs> yeah. do we know from modern um, marine uh, primary producers that they different groups uh, have these different systems. Yeah, they, they talk about that in the Galbraith and Martini paper. Other papers that have looked at that, I don't remember exactly which studies, but I can look it up for you. Okay, but is that like major difference between I don't know? Yeah, um, diatoms and yeah, coccoliths, or even within the diatoms. Yeah, yeah, bigger plankton tend to have uh, use more nutrients uh, mm -hmm. to carbon. Yeah. So, so the strength of the biological pump is just of the soft tissue pump is half the story. That's how that increases the rate at which you sort of tunnel yeah. carbon to the deep ocean. But the other half of it is the rate at which the ocean brings the deep water back to the surface, exactly. which allows supersaturated water to outgas. And I, in 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 Genie, uh, I was wondering how much the effect of the change in the ocean circulation. Uh, is how much role that had in, in the CO2 drawdown you're seeing. Is, is the ocean circulation not doing very much to the CO2, or, uh, or, uh, uh, or, or is it actually a big, big player in it, what's it going on? It is a on? big player. I mean, the, the uh, solubility pump also changes. Yeah. So I, I mean, and yeah. the, the change in the, 
in the uh, uh, in the intensity and the pattern of the ocean circulation, not just the oh, yeah, it solubility. Oh yeah, that's pump. what's changing the the nutrient distributions as well, and and yeah, it's also changing how much nutrients are coming back to the surface, of course. Yeah, but it's uh, it's definitely important, and that's why I wanted to run the same circulation changes, but we with these two different versions of the model. So, so your model uh, would suggest that the, the carbon sink there in these glacial periods is the Southern Ocean? Uh, well, partly, not, not only. Okay, not only, but no. uh, if you could just sort of uh, give some estimates of where this, where this carbon is actually mostly. Well, we can... Oh, sorry, going the wrong way. Wanted to go back to the map. Uh, it looks this like one. it looks like it's, it's in the southern a ocean. A lot mostly, in the right? sort of north of the biogeochemical divide in the southern ocean. So the the question would then, of course, be that that one would like to see core records of enhanced export production that well, is preserved really in these sediments, or do you do you think it's just deep carbon storage in the DIC reservoir? Mostly, yes. You don't really need increased export production. You just need the exported material to actually remineralize and the remineralized part to stay in the deep ocean. And also that this remineralized part actually contains more carbon per nutrient that is taken up. So you don't really need larger export production. You, you can actually even go with lower export production and still maintain more carbon in the ocean. Yep, one more question. Is the model as sensitive to nitrogen as to phosphorus? Uh, the model doesn't have nitrogen. It's, uh, since it's for long time scales, it uh, works with only phosphate, and then it has some representation of some of the nitrogen cycle, but there it's still, I kept that at Redfield. So it's, yeah. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Marlin. Uh, and I would like to wrap up by thanking all of our speakers and thanking you for coming here to the RA6 session. Thank you.